Hello? Hello, good morning. I didn't hear you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our third day at South Summit 2016. And welcome to this beautiful stage, the playground stage. My name is Helena, and I'll be your MC on this stage this morning. I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that today is our last day at South Summit 2016. Oh, I know. The good news is that we have prepared a fantastic program for you this morning. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the program because we are starting big. As big as the presidency of the United States of America. Is there anything bigger than that? Well, yes, there is. It's called big data. And to talk to us about the importance of big data on, so on something as important as the American election campaign, we are very lucky to have with us one of the most influential Latinos in the US. And he's from the Canary Islands. With a degree, a master's degree in um, public administration from Harvard University. He is, wait, a political and a corporate advisor, a business and a social entrepreneur, a passionate advocate for a sustainable world. And I tell you, he can do it all. He's also the president of the Advanced Foundation, uh, sorry, the president of the Advanced Leadership Foundation, where they train and they empower our next generation of, of global leaders. And I'm sure he knows a little bit about that. He is also, and just to mention some of his political experiences, uh, been in, involved in 14 different national, regional, and local campaigns, including those of President Barack Obama and President Bill Clinton. He's now in the midst of a campaign with the person that could become the first woman president of the United States of America. He is also, wow, I say, can life get any more thrilling than that? Come on. He is also a, an amazing speaker, and I know you know, and you just want me to go, so wish granted. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Juan Verde. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I truly appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you also to the organizers of this wonderful event. It is a, a pleasure for me to be here. South Summit has now become one of the most influential events of its kind in Europe, and uh, it is an honor to be associated to it. I want to share with you some ideas and um, thoughts about what happened in the United States with the Obama campaign. And although I will be talking about big data and the important role that it play, I'm more interested in talking to you about innovation and entrepreneurship and the role that it actually played in the elections in the United States. I also think that we learned a lot in, in those two campaigns in 08 and later in 2012. And a lot of those lessons are now being implemented in the Hillary Clinton campaign. The most important thing, I think, is that a lot of those lessons are actually um, very much um, applicable, for lack of a better term, to any company, any other organization that is going through change and it's interested in growing. And that's what I actually want to talk to you about this morning. We are at a very interesting and historic moment in history. And I think that innovation, entrepreneurship, technology, big data, these are all very strong forces that are shaping the world. But I thought that this is not unique to our time. I thought about 1832 in England. At that time, there was something interesting going on in the British Parliament. There was a group of members of Parliament that wanted to abolish slavery. And there was another group, the opposition party, that said that that was actually economic suicide. And that in the midst of the worst economic crisis that the country had seen in decades, it was pretty stupid to actually do away with what they thought was their true economic advantage, which was free labor from the slaves. 
at the end of a lot of debate back and forth, they actually made the right decision, in my opinion, in the abolished slavery. And you're probably thinking, what does that have to do with innovation and entrepreneurship or even competitiveness in the economy? I think that it had everything to do with it, and let me tell you why. After that law was passed and slavery was abolished, the members of the political world had to actually work side by side with the representatives of the scientific world, with entrepreneurs, with business people, and of course, members of civil society. All of them had to work together to create the right conditions for innovation and technology to flourish. Entrepreneurs had to come and develop new technological breakthroughs in an attempt to find an alternative to free labor. And through that process, a wonderful technology, the steam engine, was developed that gave birth to the train, as we know them today, the railroads, and of course, to the ocean lines, the transatlantic trade, which gave birth to the, rev to the uh, Industrial Revolution, which made England the most competitive, wealthiest nation for decades and decades after that. And that's actually where we are right now. Innovation and technology are here as an opportunity for us to take our economy to the next level. And here are the three ideas I'd love to share with you today. First of all, that innovation is the key driver when it comes to competitiveness and economic growth. Number two, that if you actually want to be innovative within your organization, or whether you are a government and you want to increase innovation levels in your society, the most effective way is to actually bet on the entrepreneur. Do everything possible to have entrepreneurs drive that change. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And lastly, that yes, there is room for entrepreneurs within a company, within a traditional corporate world. So let's begin with the first of those three ideas. I mentioned to you before that this is a wonderful, amazing time in history. Never before have we seen an era where the power of an idea, the power of a product or service was able to actually reach hundreds of millions of people in such a short amount of time. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about and how technology is changing the world, Radio took about 40 years to reach 50 million people. Television took 13 years to reach the same 50 million people. Internet, three years. Facebook, a single company, took nine months to reach, not 50, 100 million people. And that's the kind of speed that we're talking about. And that's the kind of force that is actually shaping the competitive landscape around the world. So let's think a little bit about why this is happening. What are those trends or forces that are actually creating a very, very difficult and very different landscape for companies? First of all, globalization and market liberalization. The amount of goods and services that are now being traded across countries and across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, north and south, east and west, has never, ever been seen in the world. That has to do, obviously, with increased globalization, but also with the removal of barriers through market liberalization. And for the first time ever, we're beginning to see that this is actually bidirectional. And by that, I mean that for many, many years, innovation came from the north to the south, from the rich countries to the emerging markets. And that's actually beginning to change, and that's actually quite good because of technology and because of innovation, competition now comes from anywhere in the world, from a garage in India to a place in the middle of nowhere in the forest in Brazil. We now have to understand that competition could come from anywhere. But there are also some geopolitical challenges that also have an effect. In particular, I want to talk about population. My father was born in 1945. And in one generation, from his generation to my generation, the world population has gone from 1.8 billion on Earth to more than 7 billion people today. 
And that's interesting because not only are we seeing a, a very significant increase in, 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 in the, you know, the demographic composition of the world, but when you look at economic indicators for the last 100 years, people are becoming richer and richer. No matter what indicator you want to look at, whether it's GDP or rent per capita, whatever it is, you will see that people are getting richer. So you're beginning to see a trend. More and more people making more money. And as they make more money, which is good, and they're more developed, their consumption behavior changes. And they want to have not a motorcycle, but a car. And if you have a car, you want to have a second car. And that's actually good. That's very good. The problem is that the resources on Earth are quite limited. And that's not sustainable. The only way for us to be able to reach the new market, to reach those millions of new people that are coming into the market, is through technology and innovation. And lastly, I want to talk about climate change. Climate change, the debate about climate change is completely over. No matter what you think about climate change, the truth of the matter is that from a scientific standpoint, climate change is not only real, but it's us human beings that are accelerating the process. And therefore, we will have to live in a low carbon society. The economy will have to be greener. There's no other way. For that to happen, we'll have to get there through innovation and technology. And so what appears to be a number of different potential crises and dangers are actually wonderful opportunities that require entrepreneurship, require innovation, require brave people thinking of a better world. You know, innovation is changing because one decade ago or one generation ago, Someone could actually innovate here in Madrid and come up with an idea and create a, a manufacturing plant. I don't care, shoes, anything. That innovation was enough for him or her to be very wealthy for decades to come. Probably enough for his generation and the next generation. But that's no longer the case. Innovation is extremely perishable nowadays. The life cycles of products and innovation is shorter much shorter than ever before. And so the key to understanding innovation is that today, innovation must be continuous. And I want to talk a little bit about the case in the United States. I, I am not the most objective source. I had the honor and the privilege of having served President Obama during his first administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Europe. I was in charge of the bilateral trade and economic affairs between the United States and Europe. And I say that because I can assure you that President Clinton, after he got to power, he truly understood and was actually quite committed to making innovation the true comparative advantage of the United States. This quote here, I think, captures the idea. Today, competition is more intense the challenge is more difficult, and that is why the country that leads the innovation race in the 21st century will also lead the world economy. Just to give you an idea, President Obama got to power in 2008 in the midst of the worst economic crisis that the world had seen since the Great Depression in the 1930s. And look at where we are now. A lot of people said that at that time, we would not, we should not have the luxury of thinking about innovation, about human knowledge, about education. And far from that, that idea, what President Obama did was to actually undergo the largest investment in innovation, research and development in the history of the United States. People have called the last eight years the new Apollo project making a reference to what he meant for the United States from a technological standpoint, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a business opportunity standpoint to send a man to the moon in the 1960s. A lot of the technologies that have changed the world today, the cell phone, the personal computer, the microchip, Wi-Fi, GPS, you name it, a lot of these technologies that we now take for granted, they came from that era where we decided to spend millions and millions of money into sending a man to the moon, and the technology that was developed changed the world. 
We are now investing more money in the United States, proportionally speaking, than any, at any other time in history. We are now investing more money in one strategic sector of our economy than ever before. That's innovation, which is the key to the future. And this is not just happening in the United States. It's happening around the world. It is no coincidence that the 10 countries that are spending the most in innovation R&D are also the top 10 economies. The United States continues to be the most innovative nation, I think, because in part, they get it. They understand that the priority has to be R&D, innovation, human knowledge. The United States, out of the top 10 countries that invest the most in the world, the United States was responsible last year for almost 40% of that amount of money spent in innovation, 40%. In fact, the United States spent more money than the following three nations together, Germany, China, and Japan. It is no coincidence that there's a strong correlation between innovation and GDP, innovation and wealth, innovation and economic output. But let's talk about what exactly does it mean to innovate? What is innovation? And yes, innovation is actually inventing things that don't exist. Innovation is doing things differently and coming up with new, uh, coming up with new technologies that actually change the world. Nanotechnology, renewable energies, aerospace, biotech industries. And, and that's all great. But I'm actually more interested in talking to you today about how innovation can change your day to day how you in your own company, in your own organization can actually make things differently. Innovation and the great opportunity that innovation brings to companies has everything to do with finding ways to do what we do on a daily basis in a more efficient way, in a more productive, or even in a more cost savings approach. And I thought about sort of innovation in a different way. You know, again, people think that innovation means let me go out there and invent something cool and different. But you know, I'm 45 years old. I remember when I was a kid walking around airports and people were actually dragging the bags. It wasn't until 35 years ago that someone came up with the idea of putting wheels on luggage. That's innovation. Something that we have been with for the last tens of thousands of years. And someone came up with a stupid, simple idea of putting wheels on luggage. And What's ahead of us is actually what's amazing in terms, of, in terms of what's ahead. You know, I have a friend of mine who inherited a traditional construction company. And it's interesting because it was in the worst of the economic crisis here in Spain. And what he actually thought of doing was, hey, I'm not going to compete. I'm going to disappear as a company if I continue to do what everybody does in the same way. So he decided to retrain his staff. He decided to acquire technology, and he was able to transform a construction company into uh, an advanced infrastructure development company. His company now does installations of very sophisticated equipment and very sophisticated structures. And he did that because he understood that innovation meant to take advantage of what he had, apply knowledge, and turn it and transform it into something a lot more interesting or the traditional company that has a pharmacy and they produce some medicines and decided to actually invest in a lab, acquire talent and management, and transform their company into something completely different, in this case, into a biopharmaceutical or biotech company. And let's think of some examples of what this means on a day-to-day. -to, -day. to me, innovation is thinking about how I can come up with a new service. How do I provide greater value to my clients. Um, it could actually mean something as simple as doing more with less to optimize the resources that I have. Or it could actually mean something as simple as finding ways to innovate so that my people can be a lot more productive. Those of us who have done sales in the past actually have noticed that yes, new customers are needed and they're great, but it is extremely important to also find ways, applied innovation, to keep the most profitable, the best clients you have. And so client retention is also a way to be creative and increase the competitiveness of your company. 
new geographic horizons to, to take and find ways to get your products to other markets. Identifying and meeting new markets' demands. You know, sort of going out there and being a lot more proactive so that you not, not only meet the demands of existing present demands of your clients, but you think about what they'll need tomorrow. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. My wife and I love, love horses. And uh, some time ago, we decided to do a trip to the United States, to Colorado, and uh, there's a wonderful national park there. And being the adventurous people that we are, we decided to go on this kind of crazy trip, which was to go on horses for seven days to a natural, natural park where there were no people. You could actually be there for seven or eight days and not see a single human being. And I remember the moment I went to pay for the trip, I immediately, when I pulled out the credit card and the guy passed the credit card, I immediately get a message on my smartphone. And I look at it, and I couldn't help but to have a big, huge smile. My credit card company had identified me as someone who was 45 years old, who had two kids with a certain level of income. He was about to engage into a high-risk activity and sent me an insurance policy. The insurance policy gave me the, the possibility if anything happened, a helicopter would come in and get me out. And if I died, or my wife, there was, a, it was a, there was a $1 million policy for my kids. I immediately pressed OK for $10, and I got the, the insurance policy. But the point here is that through big data, through innovation, through technology, that company was able to, only, to not only give me a product that I didn't know I needed, but to actually get ahead and develop a whole new demand for services that were not even available before. That is innovation. And I can go on and on, I think, sort of a lot of different ideas, how to motivate people, how to inject enthusiasm into the people you work with and the people that work for you. That is innovation. So again, I think that it's innovation, it's good, but we don't have to go out of our ways to invent new things. We have to find better ways to do what we do in a more efficient manner. Here, you will see a survey that was done by Price Waterhouse around the world in over 30 different countries. And they actually surveyed and asked CEOs of large, medium, and small-sized companies. And the question they asked was, where will your growth come from in the next five years? In blue, you see the answer from innovation companies. In red, in, 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 I'm sorry, in gray, it's the medium, the, the average uh, company, and red, were more traditional industrial companies, non-innovative companies. So the first question, and I apologize, I kind of made a mistake, but the first question was, how much will you grow in the next five years? Innovative companies answer that on average, for the next five years, they were going to grow 62%. Average companies were going to grow 35%. Traditional companies were going to grow 20%. This basically means that between innovative and non-innovative companies, there are 40 points. There's a delta of 40 points when it comes to expected growth. And the second question they asked was, all right, you're going to grow. That's great. Where will that, grow, where will that growth come from? Surprisingly, 93% of those companies said that they were going to grow through innovation. Only 2% of those companies were going to grow through acquisitions. And about 5% we're going to grow through organic growth. So innovation, again, is the key to a very, very competitive world. And let me now sort of conclude this first part of my presentation. Three ideas I want you to take with you. Innovation is by far the most important and the key to competitive, competitiveness and growth in a globalized 21st century world. Therefore, if you want to be competitive, if you want to remain competitive, and grow, you have got to innovate. Innovate is no longer an option. Innovate is a must, is an absolute requirement. Also, that innovation changes absolutely everything. The largest employers and economic leaders of the future will be professionals, organizations, and even industries that are fully, truly committed to innovation as part of their DNA in a very decisive way. And lastly, that companies and institutions that do develop the most effective innovation strategies will also be the most competitive companies. 
All right, so yes, innovation is the key to, to being competitive, but how? What is the most effective way to increase the rate of innovation within a company or within an economy? According to the Obama administration, and this is something that I am absolutely certain of, it has everything to do with helping entrepreneurs. Creating the right conditions, once again, for entrepreneurship to flourish. And let's take a look at this second idea. Why? Only entrepreneurs are crazy and persistent enough to actually go out there with an idea, find the money, find the technology, find the people, find the talent, work hard, and transform an idea into a company and a company into an industry and change the world. And there are very, very few forces that are more powerful than human will. And that's what an entrepreneur brings to the table. They gather the necessary resources to transform an idea into a product and change the world. So, as I was thinking about this, I was actually trying to compare the United States to other countries that are not as innovative. And I was born in this country. I left here when I was 16 years old. And I think that I'm more than bilingual. I think that I am bicultural. And I say that because I think I have a pretty good understanding of some of the differences between the way we Europeans view the world and competitiveness in the United States. And far from saying that the United States is better than other countries, what I do want to say to you is that there are differences. And I'd like to share with you some of those differences. I think that the United States is a unique place in the sense that they love entrepreneurs. It probably has something to do with the fact that the very first people that came to the United States at first were entrepreneurs. You have to be crazy or a true entrepreneur to get on a boat with your family 400 years ago and get across the Atlantic, not knowing where you're going to land, not knowing what you're going to do when you get there, not knowing whether you're going to survive the trip, looking for a better world, for more opportunities. And wave after wave of immigrants in the United States, the people that are always come first are always the most entrepreneurs. And perhaps there are some cultural and historic reasons. The second idea I want to share with you is the sort of the idea that the United States has about individualism. They believe that if you give opportunities to an individual, if he succeeds, you give him education, you give her the right opportunities to grow, once they do grow, they will rise the tide, and their community will grow. And perhaps in other parts of the world, the approach is different, where they look at the community and they try to do everything for the community to grow. Just different perspectives. But what's unique about that way of understanding the world is that, in my opinion, when it comes to an entrepreneur, there's a very different perception of entrepreneurs. My father was an entrepreneur. He started a company at the age of 19, I hear the wonderful story. He had a Vespa, and my mother was in the back of the Vespa, nine months pregnant, and they would go around painting homes. And that's where he got his start. But I grew up understanding that entrepreneurship is something good. I'm afraid, my friends, that today, when you hear about someone who's successful in the private sector, many times people say, you know, who did, who, who did he or she steal the money from? How did he get there? And there isn't always a positive attitude about entrepreneurs. And I think that's very different in one country versus the other. Risk-taking is viewed differently. I'm afraid that in many countries in Europe, people are not encouraged to take risk. If you take risk and you fail, you carry that stigma with you for the rest of your life. In the United States, it's normal for you to fall and get up over and over again. I will tell you a quick story. In 2003, I was part of a management consulting firm, a publicly traded firm, a very large corporation, and I was the head of Latin America for that company. I was invited to form or to be part of the search committee for a new CIO in the company. And I remember as if it was yesterday, I was as part of this panel, and there were three finalists interviewing for the job. One guy, late 50s, had worked as CIO for a number of different Fortune 500 companies, great guy, wonderful performance tra track record. And then there was a second guy, 40s, also very, very talented. And there was a third guy, 31 years old, 
He wasn't wearing a suit, not a tie, very young, looked like a kid. And after we finished with the two other interviews, the CEO was tired. He wanted to get home, so he went straight through the interview and just told the guy, the young guy, listen, you know, we've just, we just interviewed two people. Both of them could very well do the job. They're great for the job. You don't have as much experience as they do. Let me not waste your time. I'm going to ask you one question. Why should I hire you? The guy gets up from his chair, looks at us in the eyes, and says, I'm 31 years old. I have gone bankrupt five times. I have learned so much in that process. I have made so many mistakes. But let me tell you, I am a much better person for it. And those mistakes that I made, that I pay for it, you are not paying for them. I am bringing my experience. I am bringing my failure to you as an asset to your company. And if you want somebody to get up in the morning thinking about how you become more innovative, how you become more competitive, and how to become a better company, then I'm your man. Because I will go to bed thinking about it, acting, and doing everything I can. We gave that person the job. So the perception was very different. Yes, he had failed. Yes, he had gone bankrupt. But his drive, his ability to innovate and to get up is what made a difference. Greater rewards. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I think that the perception is that if you make a lot of money in the United States by being an entrepreneur, it's okay. And it's not also always the case in other parts of the world. So let me share another quick story with you because I think it's, it's very telling. A couple of years ago, I went to a wedding in South Carolina, and I was looking for my friend's address. Uh, we were in town for the wedding, so we decided to see an old friend of mine from college. This is a guy, Ryan, who at the age of 40 had um, also gone bankrupt two or three times. He was a millionaire. And I was driving through this wonderful neighborhood, beautiful homes. I mean, it was like out of this world. And as I'm driving in, in the street looking for the right number, I see these two girls, 10, 11 years old, and they are on the sidewalk in front of a beautiful mansion, and there was a table with a cardboard that said, lemonades, $1.50. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, only in America. So I stopped the car. My wife and I get out of the car. We go talk to the girls, and I said, oh, so, so tell me about you know, your experience as an entrepreneur. You're 11 years old. And she goes, yeah, my father took us yesterday to the market, and he uh, explained to us how and why we needed to find the best lemons that we could find. The lemons have to be organic so we can have a great product and we would have a story to tell. My father told us about the importance of smiling when you sell a product. My father told us a story of, and the importance of distribution, of customer service. You know, I was just blown away by the whole conversation with an 11-year-old girl. Interesting enough, that was my friend's house. And there comes Ryan approaching us. And I just said, Ryan, you're amazing, man. No wonder you're such a great entrepreneur. Here you are teaching your kids how to become, how to become an entrepreneur. Guy looks at me and says, you don't even know the best part. I charge, they charge $1.50. 25 cents are mine. The idea is mine. <laughs> you know, the funny thing there was not, he didn't need the money. The kids didn't need the money. He wanted to teach them values, and we wanted them, he wanted them to understand the importance of hard work, of innovation. And he said, you know why I'm charging them 25 cents? Because the idea is mine, and they need to understand the power and the value of ideas. They need to understand what intellectual property means. They need to understand what consulting means, the power of ideas, of knowledge. And I want them to understand that. If that would have happened in Spain, with all due respect to this country, the very first thing that would have happened, you know, the neighbors would have been walking by and, one, you know, the husband would have said to the wife, my God, those guys, they must be going through a very difficult time. They have the poor kids selling lemonade. And then the second thing that would have happened would have been that the police would have come and would have asked them for a license for selling, you know, and then probably would have gotten arrested because you have the young kids underage working. You know, they're just very different attitudes toward towards risk-taking and towards understanding entrepreneurship and innovation as something positive, understanding that, that entrepreneurs take risk, they create jobs, and overall, they're a very positive contribution 
to society and our economy. Let me move on very quickly. There are also some institutional reasons that explain why the United States is so much more innovative and entrepreneur than, uh, than other countries. Some of those reasons have to do with the legal and legislative framework. For example, if you go bankrupt in the United States, seven years after you go bankrupt, everybody, the banks, the institutions, everybody has to erase your entire record, which gives you a second chance to get started again. In Europe, if you go bankrupt, you carry that debt for the rest of your life, and it becomes very difficult to ever recover from that. Labor market is more flexible. I'm not going to go into details, but it is what it is. It is a lot more flexible than here. Stock options, the way companies are taxed in the United States, if you're an entrepreneur, you pay less taxes than if you're employed by a corporation. In the United States, if you give stock to a company, you only pay tax when you sell it, not when you're given the stock option, which gives you an incentive to continue to work to make sure that the value of your company continues to increase. So those, again, those are just ideas as to what, what um, makes a difference. Another area is the easier access to capital, and particularly the role that risk capital plays in the United States when it comes to growing businesses. Silicon Valley is home to 35% of all the risk funds, the risk capital companies in the world. Just one area the size of Madrid. A lot of people tell me that in Europe, Rich capital has a very different definition. There's very little access to capital, and the capital takes no risk. So that, perhaps, is something we should, we should change. And now let's look at the situation in Spain. This is a survey that was done by the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. To me, it's mind-blowing. Only 8% of university students, only 8% want to be entrepreneurs. That number in the United States is over 70%. Eight versus 70%. 41%, only 41% would consider ever working in the private sector. That actually means that almost 60% want to work in a non-private sector job. Public education, NGOs. 30% want to be government employees, funcionarios. Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. But not everybody can be a government employee. And there is something positive about being an entrepreneur. And therefore, I think we have to change our attitude, our culture. I'm so proud that Spain is one of the best soccer teams in the world. We have such great teams, Barcelona, Madrid, Atletico, so many others. Why? I think it has everything to do with our culture and the way we view and understand football, soccer. I have 11 nephews and nieces. When you, your son turns one or two, you give him a soccer ball, right? And he's kicking the ball around the house all day. When he's three and four, he goes to school, and in every break in school, they get together and they play with their friends. When they get out of school and they're waiting for the bus, everybody gets together and they play a football match. And then they go home, they do their homework, and they probably, by the age of five or six, they have joined a team, local team or, you know, school team, and they're all playing so soccer. When my nephews go see my parents on the weekend, all the kids get together, and they play again. And then my brother will take my nephews to go see a soccer match on Sunday. And they have this amazing idea in the role models um, like a lot of these wonderful players. And that's all great. That's why we're a world power when it comes to soccer. What would happen if we had the same attitude about entrepreneurship? That picture you see here is a picture of two young girls, ages 12 and 13, that won an award for young entrepreneurs in the United States last year. And to me, that's very telling because early on, they're teaching them values that have everything to do with innovation and competitiveness. So, the third idea I want to share with you is that companies can and should innovate internally. There's a wonderful new concept that I've been reading about a lot lately, and that is entrepreneurship. Not entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. And these are companies that actually encourage and bring 
entrepreneurs into their structures. Because entrepreneurs bring fresh thinking. They bring attitude. They bring ideas. They bring power. And that is a wonderful match. Because entrepreneurs don't have money. They don't have recognition. They don't have brand. And that's what the company give you. The best way to understand it to me was what once, what the professor said to me once. He said, governments should not get involved in helping companies. Governments should get, should get involved in helping entrepreneurs. And the way he explained that was actually quite interesting. He said, don't bet on the company, bet on the entrepreneur. Much in the same way that if you want to increase the competitiveness of sports in a country, you shouldn't give money to, to, to clubs. You shouldn't give money to the teams. You should do everything possible so that young people become uh, fit, so that they exercise, so that they have infrastructure where they can play sports, so that they can have tournaments, so that they can understand and value and recognize the importance of sports. Because when they do and they become better athletes, the teams get better. Better athletes make better teams. Better teams make better sports. And that's the whole idea. Better entrepreneurs make better companies. Better companies make a lot more competitive economies. Let me now quickly turn to a very quick snapshot of what the uh, Obama campaign meant in the United States. You know, a lot of people ask me, why did Obama win against all odds? In OA, he went against Hillary Clinton. She was the inevitable candidate, and she was able to win. I'm sorry, he was able to win. She will be able to win in this election. You know, when people ask me that question, I always say that it has very little to do with Obama, the communicator. He's a wonderful speaker. He communicates very well, but he had little to do with that. There are a lot of great politicians that I've met that were great speakers, didn't make it. It had everything to do with Obama, the innovator. Obama knew very well that if he wanted change, if he wanted something different, he had to stop doing things the same way everybody else did. And his campaign was completely different. In fact, the famous Forbes magazine awarded the Obama campaign as the best company of the world that year. But let's look at how Obama innovated. Obama innovated by being a very different communicator, aspirational policy, politics. And for me to understand what aspirational politics meant, I'll tell you a quick story. When I started uh, the 2008 campaign, I was part of the Hillary campaign. After Hillary lost the primaries, I was lucky enough that President o Senator Obama at the time asked me to join his campaign. And a couple of us were asked to go to a retreat. And they wanted to explain to us what the thought was, what the, what the idea was of aspirational politics. And I remember how David, the campaign manager, um, explained it to us. He said, people don't remember what you tell them in politics. People remember how you made them feel when you told them. And that kind of communication means appealing to your gut, appealing to people's feelings. When you hear Obama talk, he doesn't give you big numbers and, and you know, gives you big words. He talks to you about feelings. He talks to you about the kind of world we want for our kids. He talks to you about hope. But more importantly, what he actually did was innovate by changing completely the way his campaign was managed and how he led as a manager. And that has everything to do with what's possible through innovation and technology. Let me give you two examples of, that, of the, how that happened. And this is not a, good, a new idea. The whole idea of aspirational politics is the way Apple or even Nike sell products. Nike doesn't tell you, oh, I have a better shoe, buy it. They talk about just do it. They talk about feeling. They talk about hard work. They talk about how you feel when you exercise, when you use our product, or you know, think different when it comes to Apple. But that is great. He innovated in the communication front, but he also uh, innovated with the use of technology. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how big data became 
the difference in the comparative advantage for the Obama campaign, both in OA later in 2012, and it will certainly be the key to the success of Hillary Clinton this time around. Big data is collecting all kinds of data points, thousands of data points, analyzing that information in a CRM, but where technology is not a part of a campaign, technology is the campaign, and every decision is made through the analysis of technology. I'm not going to go into much detail. I have an entire presentation about this point. But the whole idea, if I can summarize it in a, in a, in a thought, is the following. I have worked on many different campaigns, and it used to be the case where a consultant would apply his knowledge, his experience, his, his background, and, and give a decision. That is over. Today, campaigns are using technology to drive data. And the data gives you the ability to make decisions. You still have to apply your knowledge, your experience, your know-how, but you apply at the numbers and looking and understanding what data tells you. And that is the main big difference. Because what big data allows you to do is concentrate your efforts. Let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that. In the big data room that we had, we used to call it a cave because it was full of crazy people. They lived in the dark. I don't know if you knew this, but computers run faster in cold places. So that place was extremely cold. That's where the big data guys lived. And in 2012, if we had the maker of your car, you know, if you drove a Volkswagen versus a Cadillac, if I knew what car you drove, if I knew your name, and I knew your zip code, where you lived, I could predict with 95% chance if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Now, that's important because if I know that you're a Republican, I'm not going to spend a penny on you because you're not going to vote for me. And if I know that you're a Democrat, I'm not going to spend a penny on you because you're going to vote for me. So I just liberate all of my resources to spend it on you, an undecided candidate. And that is the power of big data. So let me give you another example of what big data innovation means. This is the very same guys in a very meritocratic way were allowed on Fridays to come to the campaign director's office, right? And anybody can come up with a good idea. And I remember this young girl, 23 years old, one day she came to the office and told David, my God, I found this big data analysis that has given me an amazing conclusion. And David said, well, what? Tell me. There is a huge, big concentration of George Clooney female fans that live in that east corridor between Boston and Washington, D.C. And David said, so what? They're females, they're Democrats, they're going to vote for us, they're going to give us money, so what, what do I need this information? And she said, you're, you know, you're such an idiot, you old people are all the same. By the way, David was like 46, 47 at the time. But to her, he was very old because he didn't get it. She actually came up with the idea of a raffle. So for every $10 contribution, you would be given a number for the raffle, a lottery. We knew they were young females. We knew that they were in the ages of 30 to 45. We knew where they lived. We, we knew their profile. You know what the big prize was? If you won that lottery, you and your best friend would be given two tickets to go have dinner with President Obama and George Clooney at George Clooney's home. We raised $17 million in 48 hours. Think about that. Young females, we knew where they lived. We knew how they consumed information. We did a very segmented communication strategy utilizing social media to get to them. It didn't cost us a penny. And here's another and last example before I conclude. Matt Barson is today the U.S. ambassador to the United Kingdom. Young guy, Harvard grad, bright. And he came up with the idea at once that we should charge for, we should charge people to come listen to Obama. You know, and David said, what are you, stupid? No, 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 no. What I want you to do is we're going to have a meeting. I want you to bring everybody you can. In fact, come and ask me for money for buses, for sandwiches. I want as many people. I want the stadium to be filled. 
So no, absolutely no, categorically no, there's no way I'm going to give you, I'm going to let you charge for that. And this is what happened. He said, okay, then I'll have to return the 5,000 tickets I already sold. The way he did it was he used big data to understand what musical bands people listen to in their local communities. And then he went to the musical bands and said, would you like to come and play for free to our concert? And they said, yes. And then we got that idea. People showed up because they wanted to listen to the bands, and then they listened to Obama. And we got that idea, and we took it to the next level. And this is what we did with it. We charged people to go to a concert with Bruce Sprinting, zero. The price per ticket was their data, their name, their profile, their education, where they lived, what the preferences were. And so the big data analysis would come in and we actually do great things. So one of the things we did, 80,000 people showed up for this concert for Bruce Sprinting in Iowa. 80,000 people. And Obama came up, gave a wonderful speech. People were crying in the middle of the, you know, during the intermission. And Obama asked the 80,000 people to actually reach out to five undecided people and send them a WhatsApp, send them a text, send them an email. 80,000 people times five undecided, we were able to get to 400,000 people without spending a single penny. That's the kind of innovation, that's the kind of meritocracy that we're talking about. Let me end with a quick video. It's a minute and a half, and it, it explains why Obama made a difference when it comes to innovation. If you can play the video. Here, here, here's, here, here's my point, Virginia. That's how this thing started. It shows you what one voice can do. One voice can change a room. And if a voice can change a room, it can change a city. And if it can change a city, it can change a state. And if it can change a state, it can change a nation. And if it can change a nation, it can change the world. Virginia, your voice can change the world tomorrow. In 21 hours, in 21 hours, if you are willing, if you are willing to, to, to endure some rain, if you're willing to drag your, that person you know who's not going to vote to the polls, if you're willing to organize and volunteer in the office, if, if you are willing to stand with me, if you're willing to fight with me, I know your voice will matter. So I've just got one question for you, Virginia. Are you fired up? Are you ready to go? Fired up? Ready to go? Fired up? Ready to go? Fired up? Ready to go? Virginia, let's go change the world. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. I wanted to share this quick video before I conclude with you for a single simple reason. Because innovation, because entrepreneurship made a difference for this campaign. And this organization became what it became because of an entrepreneur. Someone who was willing to take risk. Someone who was brave enough to think and believe that he can change the world. So I leave you with this thought. The key to being competitive in the 21st century is constant change and understanding that innovation must be continuous within your organization. What got you here today will not get you there tomorrow. The world will be very different and only through innovation will you get there. And therefore I ask you and I invite you to change before you have to change because you will have to change. Before the Obama campaign became a $1 billion company, before the Obama campaign was able to mobilize more than 3 million people, employees, sympathizers, and volunteers, be before he won the presidency, it was nothing but the idea of a true entrepreneur who was willing to innovate and change the world. So go out there. Yes, you can. Let's change the world. Thank you. Let me just say, no, no, come on, come on stage. 
Uh, I know for a fact that there's also a group of uh, Juan Verdes fans around there. Well, some of them are here, we're here. And you have nothing to envy George Clooney, because we're fans not only for your looks. <laughs> okay, so please, another warm uh, round of applause for Juan. It was lovely having you. Thank you. Thank you.